people that are listening, if you want to experience what it feels like to swim a 50 freestyle, get on the assault bike and ride for 20 seconds at 75% of your max wattage and hold your breath the whole time. And then tell me how you feel when you get done. <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> Don't do that if you have any health con health concerns, <laughs> and make sure you've got a spotter. That's that's definitely the intro of the podcast right there. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Upside Trend Podcast, your number one resource for all things fitness and performance in Switzerland. Today, I'm happy to welcome Kyle Ruth, CrossFit coach and competitor with Training Think Tank. Hey, Kyle, thanks for how's it going to come on, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on the show. No, it's, it's great to have you too. I've been following your work for quite some time, so it's good to finally be able to, to chat with you. So for maybe the audience, for the people who don't know you yet, can you give a little bit of your background? For sure. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to go back through sort of the stuff that's relevant, my you know, sort of athletic and, and educational history. For sure. Um, I was a swimmer. I swam all the way up until I was 25, 26 years old competitively. Um, primarily swam the short events, 50 freestyle, 100 free, 100 butterfly. And towards the very end of my swimming career, started to break through in 100 breaststroke a little bit. But, you know, swam it at a pretty high level, um, Division One college. Then afterwards, swam at nationals, trials, you know, a couple different things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but at that same time, I started coaching. Started coaching when I was 20, um, swimming and strength and conditioning. I was studying exercise phys in school. So I got my, my undergrad degree in exercise phys, went on to get a master's in applied sports science, which those degrees don't really exist. Uh, I, I got it from Indiana University and that degree doesn't exist anymore. But essentially, it's like a sports performance coaching degree. Hmm. Um, yeah, it was, it was pretty neat. The, the, I, I had an opportunity to really just kind of research and investigate the things that I was most interested in, yeah. which happened to be at that time, swimming, strength and conditioning, um, dry land training specifically for swimming, the use of plyometrics for improving swimming starts, yeah. biomechanic analysis, all that kind of stuff. It was pretty cool because I got to kind of direct it as I went. Um, then after that, uh, I, I moved. I was working with a team here in the U.S. that, that works with some of the Olympians uh, in swimming, Swim at Carolina. And at that time, I got into CrossFit. And I've got a really, like, addictive personality. And I got into CrossFit and then just went, like, full in to CrossFit <laughs> and started competing. Um, I've now been competing in CrossFit for 10 years, um, you know, qualified for the re regional level when they had regionals. I've competed at sanctionals now as a 35 year old. Uh, now that they've got sanctionals on a team, uh, competed at the, you know, master's fitness collective, the replacement, I think for the CrossFit games this past year as a master's athlete. So I've done that. Yeah. yeah I've been around, been around the sport quite a bit and had the opportunity to work with Olympians in the sport of, of swimming, CrossFit Games athletes in the sport of CrossFit. So I've just been so fortunate to work with people in, in awesome places and get a great education and, and kind of stand on the shoulders of giants there. So there you go. <laughs> uh, I love it. I want to you know, dive back into your past a little bit. What did your uh, competitive experience in swimming bring to your CrossFit abilities? Did, do you feel like you had an edge on any uh, maybe specific areas, whether it's breathing, competition experience? What did you take well, with you from that? I'll say first off, it was definitely not breathing. Um, I was a, so I think the reason I gravitated towards swimming is because as a kid, I was an asthmatic, right? I mean, I had really mm -hmm. bad exercise induced asthma. And one of the things that my doctor recommended was that I swim. I was like nine years old. And I loved running. Like I, I ran cross country and I ran track, but man, I would have these awful asthma attacks afterward. And they recommended that I swam. And it just so happened. I, I, I was a very gifted upper body pulling strength athlete as a child. Yeah. Uh, I set our school record for strict pull-ups at 30 in fifth grade. <laughs> and it kind of, you can kind of see why I gravitated towards swimming despite the fact I'm not the tallest person in the world, 5'11". Yeah. Just tall for a CrossFitter and very short for a swimmer. <laughs> um, but I had, you know, I had a long reach and a ton of upper body pulling strength. So I kind of, um, that got built more through swimming, but it definitely wasn't breathing. Um, and then I swam the shortest events that were available in, in the sport. So I didn't really have much uh, endurance carryover to the sport of CrossFit. In fact, my endurance capacity now far exceeds my endurance capacity when I was a competitive swimmer. I literally was a specialist in an event that took 19 seconds. So some of the things that 
I was particularly good at first getting into CrossFit, upper body pulling. The first time someone showed me a muscle up, I did a muscle up. They were like, can you do muscle ups? I was like, I don't know what that is. And they did one. And I was like, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> like, yes, for sure. I can do that. Um, you know, chest but learning butterfly pull-ups was like a snap because it felt like swimming butterfly. Like it was yeah. literally just the same, uh, the, the same movement pattern. Um, and then the other thing is like rowing metrics, my 500 meter row. First time I got on a rower, it was 120. So like I had a first lot time. <laughs> of, yeah, I had a, I, I had a lot of power coming into the sport. Um, same thing's true with like assault bike metrics. I think back when, uh, you know, they first released the assault bike. We were doing aerodyne work. I would always turn in really impressive, like 30 second max calorie scores or one minute max calorie scores. But some of that power now is faded. You know, I've kind of trained the power out of myself uh, as I've gotten deeper into CrossFit and become a little more enduring. Um, but yeah, I think that I also had some massive holes, like swimming left me with like really, despite the fact that I squatted and, you know, strong coming into the sport, I did a lot of plyometrics. My ankles were stiff, my hips were tight, like all the classic things that you get from swimming for 15 years competitively. Yeah. So is that, is that something that goes into maybe swimmers general preparation or some of the aspects that, are, that you didn't train when, when you were younger, the squatting, the maybe some running as well, some sprinting, is that now maybe more popular, let's say in the realm of, of swimmers? That's hard to say. So I still think there's this uh, resistance in the swim community to adopting, we'll just call it more functional training. Like I think there's, or, or more diverse dry land training. Mm -hmm. It's happening. It's more of a top down approach where the, the elite athletes, they get exposed to um, these elements like squatting, lunging, you know, plyometrics and, and things like that. And they recognize the value. And now it's starting to trickle down to, Uh, more of the age group programs and things like that. But I mean, I was actually just having a conversation recently with um, someone who swims at the high school that my daughter will go to eventually. And they said that that team does not use any dry land. They don't, they quote, don't believe in dry land. Like it's something that you can or cannot, like it's something that you <laughs> cannot believe in. Uh, I just, I, I laughed so hard. It's like clearly, They have no exposure to what high level swim training looks like. That was like, that was part of what I did at uh, swim that Carolina was work with um, you, you know, the dry land for not the, the top, top tier, but the guys that were Olympians, but like mm -hmm. not the top, top tier. Um, and we did dry land like crazy. I mean, these guys were, were crushing it sleds, sledgehammers, plyos, you know, RLE split squats with a pair of, 100 pound kettlebells. I mean, these dudes were getting strong. And yeah. as were, I mean, their starts were off the charts better than most of the athletes. Because back then, that was 2012, 2011, 2012, there wasn't a lot of functional training going on in swimming. It was a lot of like core stuff, people getting on the stability balls and like rolling around and, you know, Dara Torres popularizing Pilates and stuff for swimming. I'm not saying there's, there's anything wrong with that. But if you want to get off the blocks, Pilates isn't going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's, that's a good point. So maybe for those who aren't that familiar with, you know, swimming and swim training, what is, what proportion of training does dry land training take for swimmers uh, at this point in time, or at least for the athletes that you coach? Well, during COVID lockdown, it was a hundred percent because everyone was <laughs> locked out of the pools. So actually one of my good friends, uh, Dan Jackson, who's a, a swim coach here uh, in Atlanta, He, he and I, we would consult quite a bit during, during COVID and man, he was training some of those athletes and, and basically just use a skier, salt bike and rower for their conditioning work. And then he was, you know, taking them through some pretty, you would look at it and be like, man, there's some, some elements of CrossFit. There's some elements of, of functional training, some elements of plyometrics. And when those guys got back in the water, they all said like, my legs feel so good, you know? your legs die, especially these, some of these guys were like 800 milers, you know, and your legs just get gassed swimming because they're hard to train in the pool. They use mm -hmm. up a lot of, a lot of your oxygen. They use up a lot of your energy when you're, when you're swimming and they don't give you a lot of propulsion back. And so I think part of what happened for these guys during that little period of time, that COVID period of time is they, they built a lot of capacity, you know, a lot of oxygen utilization and delivery in their legs. Mm -hmm. And the result has been, they've gotten back in the water and they're like, man, I feel my legs feel good. Um, but yeah, I think, 
I, I think it depends on the events the athlete uh, specializes in. You know, I think your sprinters are going to spend a lot more time on land building, um, you know, t- building tissue because let's face it, power output has a, a decent correlation back to, to tissue size, to muscle size, mm-hmm. um, to learning to get off the blocks, learning to be a little bit more explosive. Um, and then learning to apply. And then what they do in the water, they even do resistance training in the water, right? Resistant bands. Uh, they've got these cool devices called the power rack, which is basically like a pulley system yeah. that lifts weights as, and attached to a belt that lifts weights as you go. Um, so learning to apply the strength they're building on land back into the water. Yeah, it's, it's interesting what you mentioned about the legs and maybe the concept of strength reserve that we talk about in other sports for other physical qualities, like a speed reserve, for example, for a rugby player or a soccer player. And now you're bringing that into, into the pool where maybe people could think that there might not be transfer because of, you know, the specificity or, or lack thereof. But you are, we are seeing, or you're, like you're saying, people see that and athletes feel like they're, they are, you know, more resilient. They can, they can, last longer and, and their legs get less tired simply by that, you know, heightened capacity and, and strength in their legs. I think there's something to be said for changing the way an athlete feels, especially in, in swimming where so much of it is tactile based, right? I mean, mm-hmm. the, the water creates such a powerful tactile stimulus where you, f- you feel contact everywhere on your entire body the entire time. I mean, so swimming is very different than other sports in that regard that you're very, uh, like sensory oriented as you're swimming. Um, and I think that, that getting people to feel good in the water, especially higher level swimmers mm-hmm. is like part of the, the art of being a good, successful swim coach. Just as a curiosity, how aware are you during a race of your competitors left and right in the pool? I would say uh, hyper aware, you know, in the, in the sense that like any, any sprinter, like if you talk to, to, you know, a hundred meter or a 200 meter guy, they would be able to tell you like to a T what was going on around them at any moment, because that race, which lasts, you know, a 200 meter lasts 20 seconds, uh, a 50 freestyle, depending on yards or meters is going to be anywhere between 19 and, you know, 22, 23 seconds. That span of time is so dilated in your experience that it feels like, you know, minutes of of your life have passed in 22 23 seconds and so the i I think there's a lot of sensory information that's captured during that time Mm -hmm. you know you're you're very well aware when some in in a 50 meter freestyle when someone passes you you're very aware of it or you can tell when someone's sitting at your shoulder and you've got the race locked up there's nothing you can do about it because you're at you know you're at 100 percent effort there's there's no changing the result of the race at that point you can't alter your mechanics or increase your tempo because you're already there but you're very aware of where everyone is at that time I mean I remember there's this this one race I don't know why this one sticks out to me but there was this turn and I miffed the turn like I I came in I hit and I planted my feet just a little too high on the wall and if you plant your feet too high on the wall biomechanically you're going deep right Mm -hmm. so if your feet are high you're going to push off you're going to go really deep and I remember that a turn takes like 0.6 of a second. And that, I mean, the, the number of thoughts that went through my head in that 0.6 of a second is, is unreal. It was like, oh man, that was a perfect turn. Oh no, your feet were too high. You're going to go too deep. Like all of that happened in point like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you talked about the, the sensory information of being in the water for maybe those of us that aren't real fish and that don't have really good uh, swimming technique. What does it feel like to to put out a max effort on a short distance like that, swimming in the pool? How does it compare to you know an assault bike sprint or a rower ah, sprint? That's such a good question. So first off, I think one of the cool things I got to do when I was in graduate school is I got to use this device, and uh, it basically was like it was the equivalent of an erg for swimming, except that you were swimming in the pool, so it could measure power output directly. Okay. Yeah. as you swam against it. And some of the highest wattages we ever saw were like 600, 700 watts, right? And if you just compare that back to a rower, a powerful, you put that same athlete in the rower, they're going to pull, you know, probably close to 1,000, 1,200 watts. You put on the salt bike, they're going to crank off, you know, 2,000 plus. If you take mm-hmm. an elite level sprint swimmer, you put them on a wind gate, you know, you might see well into the high 2,000s. Mm-hmm. So it's hard. 
you know, it's challenging, but it's not the same level of power output that you feel doing a 30 second max calorie assault bike. Right. Um, so there's, there's a big difference there, but the one thing that you do have is you have the breath hold component and the breath hold component makes everything feel exponentially harder. I mean, people that are listening, if you want to experience what it feels like to swim a 50 freestyle, get on the assault bike and ride for 20 seconds at 75% of your max wattage and hold your breath the whole time. And then tell me how you feel when you get done. <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> don't do that if you have any health con health concerns <laughs> and make sure you've got a spotter that's that's definitely the intro of the podcast right there <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a but to be honest that's a great way to explain the difference like your power output's not as high as it could be right because you just can't if you the crazy thing about swimming is if you try harder you don't necessarily go faster mm. right trying harder just means your hands are slipping backwards in the water relative to your body so you're not propelling yourself forward any faster and so it's like you're in this weird dance where you can't go at max effort but it feels terrible because of the breath hold right is a, as a sprinter in the water how much emphasis do you or did you put a, on the respiratory system as such to develop that that lung capacity maybe be able to, to hold as much air in as as you go along and you know try to you know, maybe fill up that tank as much as you can before you, you go into that breath hold? So I'd say this is an area of frustration of mine in hindsight, because it's something that I didn't, it, when I would talk to my graduate advisors, I would say, man, I'm really interested in the effect of hyperventilation on breath hold times and, you know, swimming performance. So like, that's mm -hmm. a dead end. Don't, don't worry about the respiratory system, worry about the cardiac system, worry about the, you know, this was what, 2005, 2004, five, six, that range mm -hmm. um and man i'm so frustrated now knowing what i know about the respiratory system and how much we can influence like co2 tolerance breath hold retention times with with hyperventilation and things like that like i really think that we could have changed the way people felt in their races it may not have changed the uh their ability to produce power but it would have changed the sensation of breathlessness that they experienced which let's face it, that creates tension. You know, when you're, when you're resisting the mm. reflexive gulps to take a breath mm. so that you can finish your race without lifting your head, like that impacts your stroke mechanics and it impacts your power output. It impacts your desire to do that race again in six hours for finals, mm. you know? So um, there, I would just say that I don't think there was as much of an emphasis on building good, uh, breathing mechanics, improving CO2 tolerance, using, you know, tools and tricks like, like, uh, hyperventilation and things like that in order to improve performance, just because it, it, there wasn't a lot of information on it at the time. People hadn't really invested uh, the book oxygen advantage hadn't come out. You know what I mean? Like it hadn't become a popularized topic at that point. And so people just weren't that interested in, uh, in breathing, remember, because, because uh, performance is never limited by uptake of oxygen from the lungs, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was told that, that was beat into my head. That was the good, good old VO2 uh, adage right there. So it's, it's funny, you're the second guest, uh, podcast guest today that mentions the oxygen advantage, and it's actually the one I'm reading right now. Uh, so for those who don't know about CO2 tolerance and, and all those things, go read that book. Can you, can you talk a little bit about hyperventilation and how that plays into your big picture of, of respiratory training? Sure. So I, I would not say that hyperventilation is a good respiratory training tool, right? Because what hyperventilation does is it blows off a lot of CO2. Mm -hmm. And you basically, if you do hyperventilation and then you do a breath hold, you're basically holding your breath in a hypocapnic, which means low CO2, uh, hyper oxygen. I don't know a, a good way to put that, but basically you've raised your oxygen levels in, in, your, uh, in your lungs and dropped your CO2 levels. And the mm -hmm. result is you're going to delay the sensation that you need to breathe. Now, mm -hmm. that can be a performance tool for a breath hold athlete. Breath hold athlete being a swimmer who's swimming in the 50 freestyle or free diver or, you know, breath hold athletes. But if your goal is to improve your just sort of central nervous system's tolerance to the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood, then you want to do 
breath holds without the hyperventilation. You can do them at rest. You can do them during walking and things like that. And uh, the, the book Oxygen Advantage goes into detail about how to do um, mm. some of those breath holds. But those are more focused on changing sort of like your CO2 thermostat is probably the, the best analogy I can give where uh, hyperventilation is essentially hacking that system and blowing off as much CO2 so that you can hold your breath for as long as possible. Yeah, so maybe uh, to, to give ahead. a practical example with some, some random numbers, let's say that you're, I like the idea of the thermostat. So let's say your base level of CO2, it's not in units or anything, it's really arbitrary numbers. Base level of CO2 is five, and then your thermostat is at seven. So as soon as you reach seven, as soon as you start accumulating CO2 and you reach seven, that's going to kind of kick into gear your respiratory system and force you to breathe more in order to, to, to exhale that excess CO2. Now, if you do some hyperventilation before your effort, now that five might become a two. So you actually yep. increase so you that a longer period of time, longer fuse before you get to that trigger point. And with the breath hold uh, training and with those, those um, different strategies that uh, Patrick, I think his name is, outlines in the oxygen advantage, you can raise your uh, thermostat level from a seven to maybe an eight or a nine, which again delays uh, your your need to your reflexive need to to breathe in. Is that a, a good way to to put it? That's an an excellent way to put it. And I think both strategies one one is a short term performance strategy, the hyperventilations, mm -hmm. and one is a long term training strategy, which is the chronic uh, breath retentions. Uh, Evan Evan Pycon, one of my colleagues at Training Think Tank, has talked a little bit about some of the. I don't want to call it danger because I don't think it's like a, a danger to your health, mm -hmm. but some of the potential performance decrements that could happen from driving your CO2 tolerance up too high. I've just yet to see that become the case with the athletes that I've used uh, chronic breath retention work. I typically find, I typically use it with athletes who are uh, struggling with um, a, a very strong sensation of breathlessness during their training or during workouts and those tend to be athletes who have a low bolt score which again is a proxy for your co2 set point essentially mm -hmm. um and and just work on on bringing that up so that they don't feel so out of breath while they're in the middle of a metcon because that can bring people to a grinding halt that that feeling that they just can't catch their breath is do you think the hyperventilation let's call it a technique might be useful before maybe a CrossFit workout, you know, before a, a short intense effort, would you want to blow off a little bit of CO2 just to increase that, that reserve just a little bit before you, you run into it? What's what's, uh, or maybe I, another question. I think, or go, go, go. I think part of the issue could be that now we're going to get into some, we're going to get into the weeds now. So now part of the issue could potentially be that when you do hyperventilate, you blow off, so much CO2 and CO2 is actually a vasodilator. Right. And so one of the things that could happen is that by blowing off some of that CO2, you're essentially constricting some of the blood vessels in your, in your limbs. So say you're about to do an assault bike, 30 second max calorie assault bike sprint. If you hyperventilate beforehand, you lower CO2, that lowered CO2 is going to restrict some of the uh, blood vessels in your limbs. And the result is that you can't get as much oxygen to your legs, despite the fact that you feel less breathless you have less oxygen delivery as a result of your lowered CO2 levels. So it, it's very much like one of the, it could be a double-edged sword, but it's not something I've ever investigated. So I don't want to say that that's not a practical strategy for improving short-term, uh, short-term high-powered performance. Mm -hmm. But I think mechanistically, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in addition to the vasoconstriction, there's also the shift of the, uh, O2 dissociation curve that's going to mm. make that's going to make you know hemoglobin more you know more sticky so harder to load O2 on and also harder to pull O2 off at the at the muscle so like you said the 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 trick with the the respiratory system is that interplay between O2 and CO2 we just think of the O2 all the time and CO2 as the bad guy but it's really a a balancing act between the two that influences all the processes of of oxygen transport and delivery in the in the body and you know, what's great is with, with a moxie, you can see that directly. You can see the, the influence of hyperventilation on uh, how sticky hemoglobin essentially is. It's such a, mm -hmm. such a valuable tool. The other thing, I just thought of this, but you, you were talk, we, we were talking about oxygen advantage. Don't you think, you're, you're into that book, 
Yeah. Don't you think it should be called the, the carbon dioxide advantage? <laughs> yeah, because, uh, yeah, it, I, I do think it's, it's really one of the highlights of the book. That's one of the things he talks about the most because, as, as you and I know, the, the O2 saturation in your, in your arterial blood is going to be between 96 to 99%. At all times, you can't really impact that on the, you know, you can't top it up. There's not much room for improvement there or for change. You can't like breathe in more and that's going to put more oxygen in your blood. It doesn't work like that, even though maybe intuitively people think that that's how it works. So it is really that, that CO2 that, that is a big driver of what actually happens with your oxygen and, and what you can influence here is going to have an effect there. So yeah, I think it's a very interesting, you know, point that he brings in the book obviously central to the the, the respiratory system uh, conversation but nobody talks about it <laughs> i know well i think i i've had this conversation with my athletes when, when i first bring this up they're like how come we've never heard of matt frazier or insert you know elite crossfit how come we've never heard of so and so doing this and i was just like do you honestly think if they found a technique like this that changed their performance as dramatically as it potentially could, that they would ever tell anybody about this? Mm -hmm. Why would they ever in an interview be like, yeah, I started doing these drills from this book, Oxygen Advantage, and man, my Metcon performance has gone through the roof. Yeah, right. You're just costing yourself, you know, quarter of a million dollars at the CrossFit Games by doing that. <laughs> yeah, That's why nobody's talking about it, because when it works, they're like, oh, I shouldn't tell anybody about this. Uh, as someone who who does evolve in you know elite um, levels or or you do compete at a high level and then you coach elite CrossFit athletes, how prevalent is the um, let's say how prevalent are the respiratory training methods being used by the elite CrossFitter community? We're talking about a Spiro Tiger, other strategies that you can use. Uh, is is that is that becoming a thing or is it not quite there yet? It's definitely becoming a thing. I think Spyro Tiger is probably the least common of them, although it mm. could be such an effective tool, mm. you know? Like, I, I, I feel like there, if there's one that has, like, the most bang for the buck, it's going to be Spyro Tiger. But um, the, the things that I think people are really into right now, AeroFit, Power Lung, just general respiratory resistance devices, anything that's going to train inspiratory, expiratory muscle um, which I've used for years and the, the simple tools in oxygen advantage were way more effective for dealing with my, uh, my breathing. But, uh, I think there's a lot of people that are into just, you know, general relaxation breathing now trying to drive parasympathetic, uh, you know, parasympathetic activation after training. A lot of people mm -hmm. are into box breathing. Mm -hmm. Um, nose breathing is starting to become really common in CrossFit, not, not necessarily in Metcons, but like, as an, an warm-up tool and adjunct after training and things like that. Um, and uh, Wim Hof breathing is – when I talk to people and I'm like, man, you should – you know, we should really start to investigate some breath work. They're like, oh, yeah, like, like Iceman and Wim Hof? And I'm like, <laughs> well, maybe, but that's just one of, like, hundreds of different things we could do. <laughs> There's, uh, have you played around with the, I guess, with the Spyro Tiger or other tools that do that with the maximal strength of your respiratory system? Um, the, the reason I asked that is I had a thought last night thinking about this, and we talked about this just pr previously on, on this chat where we talked about the, the strength reserve uh, that you can get by increasing your absolute strength and then relative to what you have to uh, output in an event or in your sport, you have a bigger reserve. Could we do the same thing with the respiratory system where by, increases your, by increasing your max capacity of your respiratory musculature, you now make a, an average uh, performance or, or a, let's say a, a, set, a set performance just relatively easier compared to your maximal capacity or strength? Yeah, I think there's a lot of research that exists that shows that very clearly. Um, that adding respiratory resistance training, inspiratory, expiratory can improve rowing performance. And in general, the consensus is that it's, it, it's a result of reducing the energy cost of breathing. Yeah, exactly. Essentially, that, that the respiratory muscles, even though using a power lung, because they typically use things that, that are respiratory resistance specifically – Versus like a, a Spiro Tiger, which can do respiratory endurance training. But they're using things that are very specifically like, you know, three sets of 10, like a pretty classic strength training 
you know, tool with like power lung or AeroFit or any, you know, they, there's a lot of them that exist. Mm. Um, and they're showing some, some pretty significant reductions in the energy cost of breathing. And I think that's, that's really telling. Now, my, as a coach, as, as a practitioner, not a researcher, I look at that and I'm like, man, what if we combine respiratory resistance training and some of the, you know, the breath hold and CO2 stuff that mm. Pat McCown's talking about in, in Oxygen Advantage. And we make it so that we've reduced the energy cost of breathing and we've made it so that people don't reach the hyperventilation point until later. Like, are we creating super athlete? It, of course, you know, there's, it's way more complex than that. But that's where my head goes when I, when I start to see these two. So I, I can say, I'll say this because I don't want to give away too much um, yes, the elite athletes that, that I'm working with and, and that training think tank are working with, they're doing breath work for sure. Um, and I would say that we're doing lots of different kinds of breath work. I think we're still in sort of the shotgun phase of figuring out what works best, but we're starting, we're very much starting to narrow that, I think. Mm. I like that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing where uh, you guys take that moving forward, transitioning now to, to talk about, uh, well, we were talking about swimming and, and now CrossFit. So what are the biggest mistakes that you see made in CrossFit when it comes to, to swimming and swim training in general? I, I think uh, I've actually talked about this on, on some podcasts before, but I think one of the big issues is that uh, when CrossFitters go to try and train their swimming, they, they try to use the same uh, technical cues, same techniques as elite swimmers. And a typical elite swimmer is built very, very differently than your typical elite CrossFitter, right? You can just start from anthropometrics, right? So if you take limb length, um, your elite CrossFitters, you know, their uh, limb length to height ratio is pretty much static, right? Like it would be like a one-to-one -one ratio is a pretty typical CrossFitter because it puts them right in the middle, mm -hmm. right? And your, your typical swimmer, their, their limb length is way way beyond their uh their height i mean i like i said i was a short swimmer i'm 5'11 and i have a six four six three wingspan so i mean like it's a, a massive difference in limb length to to height ratio and it's even worse at like the michael phelps level is is kind of insane how much longer his arms are than, than his height then you start to look at like leg length right so in general really good swimmers have super long arms and super short legs and super long torsos. Right. Right. And your typical CrossFitter is like maybe short legs, but if you have a long torso, man, deadlifts are really hard. And like yeah. stabilizing a bar and front rack is really challenging if you've got this really super long torso. So what you're, what you're already starting to see is that biomechanically the strokes that are really effective for these long limbed or long armed, uh, long torso, short legged athletes are probably not going to be as effective for uh, your typical CrossFitter who then you add all this dense muscle tissue to them. And now you've got this like bowling ball that basically just sinks the bottom. Then they don't have all the years of, uh, you know, streamlining off the walls to improve their, their scapular range of motion to allow them to get into a nice tight streamline coming off every wall. Uh, they, they lack some of the, the shoulder flexion an adduction range that's required in order to keep your ear on your shoulder when you're taking a breath. So their hands sink. I mean, it's just like I've done enough swim analyses of CrossFitters <laughs> to see the exact same set of issues show up. And it's very different than if I were to take, uh, say, your typical high school swimmer who's been swimming for, you know, six or seven years. Mm -hmm. And they're like, Kyle, can, can you help me go to the next level in swimming? The things that I would need to give them would be very different than what I would need to give to a typical CrossFitter. So typically for CrossFitters, the big things I look for are number one, can you maintain a horizontal body line in the water? Um, most swimmers have been drilled. This has been drilled in since they started when they were, you know, seven, eight, nine. Uh, and for most CrossFitters, it's really foreign because their legs are heavy and they sink. Then I look at uh, breathing. Most, most CrossFitters because of the breath hold element, the fact their face is in the water, it's, you know, a, an, unfamiliar or uncomfortable environment for them to be in they tend to lift the top of their head up when they breathe which compounds the leg sinking because when you lift your head out of the water right then your legs sink yeah. even deeper in the water and so it's like you're starting to see all these these really common these really common issues and then the thora the lack of thoracic rotation that you see in crossfitters makes breathing in swimming 
you know, rotating to breathe really challenging. And so the, the things that I found that have helped CrossFitters in particular are number one, drilling, kicking like crazy, because most of them don't have the ankle plantar flexion that's required to push water behind them. Mm -hmm. So they need to do lots and lots and lots and lots of kicking and just work on, you know, becoming better kickers in the water so that they can, for, for two reasons, one, they get a little more propulsion and two, to help keep their hips and legs up at the surface of the water so that they can swim a little more efficiently. Then I almost always have them do um, some sort of dry land, thoracic and shoulder rotation prep because without it, they just get in the water and they're so stiff. They can't rotate and kind of dissociate their upper torso from their lower torso in order to rotate to breathe. Mm -hmm. And then really working on um, just like getting a kickboard getting one hand out front and getting that ear on the shoulder and just kind of laying out and maintaining this nice horizontal body line. Um, if you were going to take a high level swimmer, you would do something so radically different than what I just described. Uh, that's why I think some of the issue is, is that the people who are coaching CrossFitters in the pool are people that were former swimmers and those former swimmers think about what they did as swimmers who swam for 10 years mm -hmm. versus thinking about what you need to do with the person who's right in front of you in order to get them into a more optimal position to swim. Yeah. So going back to look at what you have in front of you, instead of just look at what you have always done in the past. Yeah. Uh, create on the creative side, what's your take on the, uh, swim workout that Castro programmed at the games this year? Oh, that was brutal. And what a good way to make it so that swimming was just a piece of the workout rather than the whole workout, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think if, if you put all those guys in there and just a pure swim workout, I think Noah Olson takes the, takes the cake. Um, but as soon as you start to mix those things and create some of that mixed fatigue and, uh, you know, get them on the assault bike and sprinting, which really, you know, is going to impact that we were talking about the respiratory system. You mm -hmm. want to get, you want to get a lot of CO2 build up, have someone <laughs> sprint on the assault bike. Um, I just think, I think that was just very creatively programmed. I, I loved the, the setup. That's a swim workout that despite how much faster I would be, the, like I've, I've trained with Noah, uh, you know, extensively in the pool. I think th three years now of working with him in open water in the pool and things like that. And I think in that span of time, he's beat me in one, <laughs> one workout. And it was just that the kettlebell was heavy enough to set me back and I, I couldn't <laughs> catch him in the water. But like, that's another one that I, I think Frazier would have beat me in that. I think Quant would have beat me in that one. Like those guys probably would have beat me. Uh, even, even though I was enough faster in the pool, I probably could have gotten out first every time. Just there was enough other mixed fatigue that by the end, I'm not sure I would have even actually been swimming faster than them. For an elite crossfitter like Noah, how much time does he spend in the pool per week or per month? And then how does that change throughout the year as you are farther away or closer to the games? Well, I think, so the, we use a pool in, in, and swimming in general in multiple capacities. One could be a recovery session, right? Mm. I think the pool is a great place to spend your time if you want to uh, take some time to recover, right? I think the, the hydrostatic pressure is good for joints. I think being weightless for a little bit you know, feels really good. It's a, you know, very sensory in, intensive environment, but also a very quiet environment where your face mm -hmm. is in the water. You know, there's no sound there, you know, you know, that, well, there's sound, but no talking you can't get distracted by your phone because it'll break in the water. Like it's just a, a good distraction free environment. So there's that aspect, but when it comes to training, typically just one session per week, I mean, it's such a small aspect of the sport overall mm -hmm. that I think if you, if you really are dedicating more time to swimming than that, then you're, you're, maybe putting your eggs in the wrong basket unless you're like rich froning from what 2014 with that terrible swim event that he had um and at that at that point you're good enough at everything else in the sport that you should just spend your time you know develop you should spend a three-month period developing your swimming to the point that you're you know at the same level as everyone else and then you know just go back to doing your normal thing but you know one session uh in terms of fo focus I try, when I program a swim session, I try to touch on um, a mixed swim piece in there, some sort of like, you know, whether it's sandbag over the shoulder and swimming or, you know, kettlebell and swimming, so, something mixed. I try to touch on some, some speed work for most athletes and then uh, get 
a longer swim or some longer intervals in there. And I think as long as you're covering the, covering those bases, you're, you're typically doing what you need to do to make sure someone can, can handle anything that comes out of the hopper, unless they throw an assault bike sprint in, which obviously throws a wrench in that. <laughs> Um, how, how Kim is sprinting in the water, uh, how much does it transfer to improved efficiency in your slower swims, uh, compared to, you know, sprinting on dry land improves your running efficiency at, at lower percentages of your, of your max velocity? I, I think in my opinion, I think it's very similar. Um, you, you know, again, I, I think you should look at the athlete in front of you. You should run, you know, sort of like a, maybe a speed preservation curve, test, you know, 15 meter free speed swimming test, you know, 50 meter, have a hundred meter, have a 200 meter. Uh, and depending on, on the distances that the athlete competes in, you know, up to a mile time trial or whatever, and then figure out where sort of the low hanging fruit is there. So if, if they, you know, if, if the athlete is holding for, their 500 meter time trial, if they're holding three seconds slower than their max 100 freestyle, well, I think it's pretty obvious that you need to spend some time building the top end speed to get that athlete faster. Um, but if they were more like me, where they're, you know, the difference between their, their average 100 meter in their 500 and their 100 meter is like 15 seconds, then maybe you should spend some more time building endurance. <laughs> I want to shift gears a little bit and go on to the topic of mental toughness. It's a word that's thrown around these days a lot. So in your opinion, what is mental toughness and how do you actually improve it? I think in, in general, I've always thought people perceive mental toughness as this like gritting through pain or gritting through, uh, you know, something or it, it has a very like, like macho connotation to it. But what I've found in coaching athletes is that the ones that are the most mentally tough actually are, are the most mindful or aware or under, have the best understanding of how their, their mind works and they use uh, positivity tools. So here you, have, here you have this. It's like you have this person, this image of mental toughness. It's like the gritty macho guy, but it's the person who remains positive in negative situations, you know, the one who is like sunshine and rainbows who actually is more resilient than the macho tough guy who just grinds themselves into the floor. Mm -hmm. And so I, having observed this and literally in the sport of CrossFit, it grinds people to a pulp, right? I mean, it's just, the, just a function of this sport that it really is uh, a constant slog. And I've always found that the athletes that can, that can find positivity that have a more, uh, you, you know, the ability to turn uh, their lemons into lemonade are the ones that are resilient in the sport. And contrast that to what most people think. They're like, man, I just need to go tough this out. And it's like, that, that's not, or, or they, they, they fail something and they get pissed about it. And it's like that anger is actually something that I think is holding you back from improving rather than looking at it and like, man, I failed. Now I know what I need to, to work on next. Having a more objective perspective is the thing that builds mental toughness, not grit or like dogged macho perseverance. Is that, is that a quality that can develop and then that applies to a broad spectrum of different uh, competencies, even if you haven't been exposed to that particular task before? Or is there an element of specificity where you need to have been exposed to that specific maybe stimuli or event or task uh, in the past to be able to you know know what it's going to feel like and then prepare for it as a consequence of that or can you just you know do the work prior to and then no matter what is thrown at you you're gonna you know go at it let's say with peace with ease and with a lot more composure than than someone else might well i, I like you so you said with peace and ease and i like to think of it more like the Stoics would have with equanimity, right? So they look at it and they're like, this is what it is. This is what I'm doing the same event as everyone else. No one else has ever seen this odd thing that has come out before this strange combination of events. No one else is more prepared for this specific situation than I am. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I'm going to go do my best. Like there's no reason to complain about the, you, you know, it's raining for, for the, the snatch event, there's no reason to complain about the weather because everyone's got to deal with the same weather. 
And you yeah. don't have control over that. You only have control over what you're focusing on, over what you're going to attack. And I think if you can get people to build the habit of focusing on their locus of control of, over the things that they can influence, I, I always think those athletes are going to perform better over the long run than athletes who are constantly belly aching about things that are outside of their control. Or, and I say belly aching, but even just like constantly thinking about the things that are outside of their control. Mm. You know, it just leads to this neurotic, like constant, you know, flow of thought pattern that, that I think, uh, you know, keeps them in this more stressed state all the time. So they're not recovering as well between events. They're not thinking about what their next step is, or, you know, the new event is released. And rather than thinking of like, Oh, like going into the panic of, Oh, I've never seen these things before. Instead say, okay, this is what I'm up against. Now, how do I attack part A, part B, and part C of this new, you know, this new challenge that's in front of me? And I, I can imagine that this is not just something that you think one day and then you just apply that to everything that you do. It, it has to be, you have to work on it. So how do you guys at Training Think Tank kind of bake that into the cake of that training environment, that high performance environment, uh, to, so that all your athletes can benefit from that competency from that mindset and from that approach to events to workouts etc cetera, etc cetera. for sure i think the one of the first steps to that is really an, an education side is that teaching people that mental toughness is something different than what they probably think it is and some of that comes down to recommending that people read you know read the obstacle is the way ryan holiday's book which i think is a fantastic introduction to to stoic philosophy talking to people after setbacks and failures and helping them put those things into context, encouraging people to adopt the habit of changing their lemons into lemonade. Like, you know, you, you failed, you, you failed this. That's fine. Now we know what you need to work on. Whereas before you failed this thing, like we had no idea. We didn't know what we were up against. Now we know, now we know how to attack. It. Um, I think some of that comes in conversation, but then the other aspect is, integrating it into the training environment. And I think some of that comes from creating uh, competition prep scenarios where, you know, three, four weeks out from the games, uh, we, we brought Noah in this past year for a games prep camp. We brought a handful of other really talented athletes in to come train with them. And the events were all unknown every single day. It was the same structure, same format. Uh, they, you know, they knew nothing about what they were going to be attacking. But it was in a controlled environment. It was in an environment where the stakes were low. So that it was an, a good opportunity for Noah and the other athletes that were there, obviously, to practice uh, dealing with some of the, the psychological uh, tactics that can, can show up at the CrossFit Games. And this year was, man, they introduced that. Uh, I don't know how much attention you paid to the CrossFit Games. All but of it. Adding that, <laughs> dude, adding that they, they ran what? five the, six k the, the turnaround and then, <laughs> and then they got in and they thought they were done mm -hmm. and that was like the terrain on that was nasty it was yeah and and they're like all right you're, we're done you know they ran the sprint to the finish and then literally they're like no now you have to run the entire thing in reverse turn around and go back mm -hmm. it's like whoa <laughs> you better have you better have that uh the mental game turned up to level 10 if you want to be able to deal with something like that Yeah, that, that mindset, maybe that's almost that stoic approach, if you want to call it like that, to competition. Is that something that you maybe saw early on from one of the top competitors at the time that kind of startled you a little bit because you maybe hadn't thought about it this way before or just they were just thinking on a completely different level than, than the average person? I think I honestly can't remember a time that I didn't think that way. Like it just, I, I think back to when I was uh, in high school and competing and so and like really starting to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And I just always had this focus on things that were in my control. And I think my, I, I'm going to be forthright. My, my dad was a psych or is a psychology professor. And I think that there was definitely some influence there mm -hmm. where it was like, you know, encouraging me to, to shift thinking and to, to change the way that I approached problems and, and developing problem solving skills. And so I will tell you as an athlete, I always just assumed that's how everyone thought. 
And then when I started coaching, I realized that <laughs> it's a very rare skill to be able to think that way, to be able to, to turn negatives into positives, that that wasn't just a normal skill that people developed growing up, which I've now had to, had to learn and now teaching to my children. But I realized how much in teaching it to my children, you know, in school and sport, I realized how much of an advantage that little psychological skill has uh, developed over the course of a lifetime. And then, you know, the same, I, I, I recognize that some of the other athletes that I trained with and that I coached and competed with, some of them had that same ability to take something. And it's like, man, this, I'm not good at this aspect of my sport. So I'm going to go attack this aspect of my sport. And I'm going to go get better at this piece. Mm. And the ones that did kept rising. And the ones that didn't eventually stagnated and fell off. And I just always found that to be a very interesting thing. And then I, at some point, this was years ago now, but I, I read Ryan Holiday's book and it, it was like, oh, I was like, oh man, this is how I've always thought. Obst like obstacles away. I was like, this is how I've always thought. And this is how all the best athletes that I've met think. Mm -hmm. What is this? And then I realized that, you know, in, in there he introduced it as Stoic philosophy. And I was like, oh, I'm going to start digging into this. And that's since then I've been recommending that um, athletes read Obstacles Away as an introduction and then start digging into more, um, you know, complex Stoic philosophy and, and try and adopt that way of thinking in their training. Because I think it does make people absolutely more resilient. Um, I think it allows them to achieve at a higher level uh over the long run not, it's not something that's going to just make you better tomorrow you can't just say you know you, you can't look at a problem and be like i'm going to get better at my handstand push-ups and then tomorrow you're better at your handstand push-ups it literally has to be something that's like ingrained in your way of training and your training environment and the way that you think and the way that you live your life for it to have that kind of influence for you maybe going on a little tangent here but if you don't mind sharing how are you imparting this to your children how are you trying to teach your children to to have that approach to to life well the the big one so my my oldest daughter is in third grade and she's been doing digital learning so it, it's been different this year because obviously she's at home learning and one of the things that i've been trying to teach her is that you know she would get stressed about how much stuff she had left to do for the day hmm. and i would remind her that the the that by focusing on how much she has to do, she's not actually getting anything done. That she needs to focus on the next task and complete that task and then move on to the next task rather than thinking of the, the big picture. And I think that is, is kind of masked stoic philosophy, right? Where it's yeah. like solve, solve one problem at a time. The big thing is eventually you need to tackle this mountain of work. But the first thing you have to do is you have to walk up to the mountain, to the bottom of the mountain. And then you have to solve this first scramble puzzle, you know, and then you have to go around this trip. Like you can't jump up to the top of the mountain. Like you're never going to look up there and be able to solve that problem. So that's a big piece. Um, then the other one, actually, when I was just competing at, uh, most recently, it was like the first time that my kids had really been there while I was competing in an event. And I kept reminding my oldest daughter, I was like, you can't win focusing on winning. You, you win events by focusing on how you execute. Because she would ask me right before I'd go out, she'd go, Dad, are you going to win this event? And I was like, it's not what I'm focused on. And I did go out and win the event. But, <laughs> but I didn't do it by focusing on winning the event. I did it by focusing on how I was going to execute on my plan, my execution, and you know, staying in my lane to borrow an old swim, an old swim term. And I just kept reminding her of that. And now – you know, if, if I asked her, I'm like, what do you, you know, what do you have to do today? Well, I'm going to focus on my first, my first task or my first project. I just have my ELI. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, great. You're learning. You're getting it. Yeah. that, that <laughs> first, Go ahead. That first uh, task strategy reminds me of a story I heard from uh, Bud's training with the Navy SEALs where the most success, successful ones were always focused on maybe the next meal, which was every six hours at some points, or the next sunrise or the next sunset, where other people that thought too far ahead, oh, I'm going to get through those six months of grueling training, they, they didn't make it as often as the people that had a shorter kind of um, outlook on what they had to accomplish. And just like you said, 
task at hand, accomplish this, then look at the next one, kind of one step at a time, one step after the other. I think to, to that point as well, there's actually been some research that they did on Marine recruits and using mindfulness meditation. And they found mm -hmm. that the, the, you know, they just split it's, it's the Marines. So they just split them into two groups. One group did mindfulness and the other group didn't. Uh, and the group that practiced mindfulness meditation were far more resilient. Hmm. There we go. There's, t there's mental toughness. There's toughness and resilience showing up as a psychological skill again. Mm -hmm. Um, and essentially what they were teaching those Marine recruits to do is to focus on the moment, focus on the task at hand, be present. And by doing that, like injury risk goes down because you're less likely to make a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of thinking about, oh man, there, we still have like 10 weeks left in basic training. Like, I don't think I can make it through. You're like, I, I'm going to focus on making it to my next meal. Or I'm going to focus on what I'm doing right now so I can get this right. You know what I, and it, it's a simple I mean, it's so, what, when you start doing it, it, it becomes so, it seems so odd that other people aren't focused that way, that so many people are projecting so far into the future. Mm. And it's like, well, that's what's keeping you from getting done what you need to get done. Okay, so let's uh, take that and run with it. Let's focus on the next task at hand. I've got three audience questions for you, Kyle. The first one from uh, Mikolai, who asks about testing workouts and how to use them in or around training blocks. Okay, so uh, I think I am at fault as a coach for not uh, testing or I should say retesting uh, workouts in CrossFit as frequently as I probably should. Mm -hmm. um, I love the training process. I think that probably is pretty obvious at this That's point. But I, I, like, <laughs> I, I, I think if you want to be successful, you got to focus on the work, right? Focus on the training process. However, um, I try to build uh, testing into the end of training blocks. So essentially, you know, we will focus on one or two primary testers that we will, you know, we either have a baseline from previous opens or from a qualifier or something like that. And we'll run training progressions for, and this is an important point for as long as we need to run the training progressions for me to be confident that this athlete is going to improve in the tester. Mm -hmm. um, I use very much a dynamic periodization rather than a, a strict blocked periodization. So when I'm confident that all the indicators are that they're ready, then we'll go ahead and do a retest. And I typically will run some broken intervals of the workout before mm -hmm. we do that. Um, again, something I stole from swimming, uh, very common in track and field as well to do, to do broken work, but, you know, taking 20.2 as an example, um, you know, having them take a, a one minute break mm -hmm. every fourth minute or something, right. you know, along the, it was a 20 minute long workout, take a one minute break every fourth minute and pick up where you, where you left off. Mm -hmm. There's, that can be a great way to get people kind of segueing into testers after you've run, training blocks to improve the basic qualities that will allow them to, to perform better. Yeah. And another tangent on that note, I find it interesting. Those kind of interval format workouts that have started popping up at the games for the last, over the last few years that are still not kind of, you know, mainstream It's like maybe one, maybe two per game, but it's super entertaining to watch. And, and I, I do you feel like that might, you know, creep into the sport a little bit more as it goes on because of the, the appeal that it, that it actually has. I hope so. So at the sanctional level this past year, there were a handful of those workouts that were done. Mm -hmm. There was one at, uh, I had some athletes compete at filthy 150 in, in Ireland. And that was, I mean, the, the interval event was by far the most entertaining to watch. I had an athlete competing down in Brazil and they had this row sandbag over the shoulder interval where you got cut by the clock yeah. each, each round with like a minute rest between. And it was so awesome to watch the field get weeded out to just two athletes left at the end, I mean, those kind of, those kind of formats are super entertaining to watch and it's fun to be able to use what we use in training. You know, we use this interval format in training all the time to see mm -hmm. that tested is pretty cool. Yeah. I'm going to go on to the next question. Stuart asks, how would you incorporate CrossFit into field sports SNC for those that enjoy it and don't like training alone? Man, that's a good question. I, th I think there's definitely some, <laughs> during the off season, I think is probably where I would use like CrossFit as it's traditionally thought of, mm. um, as, as a training tool for, for, you know, field sport athletes. I think some of the wear and tear that can come from training CrossFit as a, a more traditional modality, I think is probably not 
prudent for in season or, or you know competitive phase at field sport athletes. I would mm. I would steer them away from that. But that doesn't mean that you can't be using elements of uh, CrossFit. You know, broad time and modal domain. It really does kind of capture everything under under that umbrella. And I think there's some some value in uh, even for field sport athletes in using sort of interval based mixed modal training maybe throughout the entire season. I just think that, you know, having someone do a bunch of chest to bar pull-ups and uh, squat snatches at 135 may not be the best use of their uh, strength and conditioning time in season, but off season, you know, why not develop new ranges of motion, new movement capabilities and, and improve their movement vocabulary. I think that's a, a real positive thing for most athletes, especially in the later stages of their career. Uh, I can't believe we're already coming on an hour. I feel like we've been talking for 20 minutes. So I'm going to just finish up with a few rapid fire questions. So try to answer as shortly as possible. Uh, a book that you recommend. So are you still there? Yeah, I'm still there. All right. You cut out at the end of that question. What was that? It was just a book uh, that you recommend. Oh man. I read this book recently. It was, uh, oh, man, was it called on having no head that or the headless way? Okay. by Douglas Harding. Um, man, it was, a, it was a strange book, but um, I, I picked it up from uh, Sam Harris's meditation app, waking, the Waking Up app, yeah. and he talked about it in there, and I went and read it, and man, it's fascinating. Uh, it, it gives you a, a very different view of your reality, and I think it challenges a lot of the preconceived notions that, that you have about who you are, who people are, and, and things like that. And it's short. I mean, it's like a 150-page read, but it was awesome. Nice. Next one, a coach to, for people to follow. Uh, my, my primary mentor, Maxwell Hag, owner of Training Think Tank. The guy taught me more about coaching, asking the right questions, training program design, how to, how to keep your program centered around the person, more athlete-centric coaching. That is the man to follow right there. And lastly, a daily practice that you've recently had success with. <laughs> Can I add a bunch of them? Because I've, since July, I've added a whole bunch. But no, <laughs> Go for um, it. Go for it. I, I created a habit stack. So I stole that from Atomic Habits. I'm, nice. You probably, re you probably read the book. But my habit stack is that I, I have a sauna. So in my sauna, I do uh, 10 minutes to 15 minutes of mindfulness meditation, followed immediately by my static breath holds. And I do that almost every single day and have since July. So I'm working on like... I don't know, a lot of days at this point, <laughs> four months. What has been that? What is, what have been the effects so far on, on that practice? The mindfulness, it's the most consistent I've been with my mindfulness meditation, my ability to uh, stop myself mid, uh, you know, mid negative thought spiral in a workout has improved dramatically. I can mm. control my attention and, and direct it where I want to want it to be rather than wherever it decides to go, which is, I think the typical, um, the, the breath holds, we talked quite a bit about this, but the, my sensation of breathlessness has, has been almost abolished and I don't have asthma anymore. I literally for my entire life had exercise induced asthma. And, you know, Pat, Pat talked about this in, in the book that, um, when your bolt score goes over 20, your asthma symptoms are going to start going down. And right around the time that my bolt score got around 24, at my resting bolt score, my asthma symptoms magically disappeared that I've had since I was like four years old. So it's been kind of cool. The weather's cooling off, which is usually when my asthma is really bad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I ride the assault bike, boom, I'm going to have Fran cough and then eventually it'll turn into a respiratory infection. Right. We've had a cold snap. I'm, I'm like week three or week two of cold training and I've had no Fran cough. I've had no wheezing. I've had none of that. Um, so I hope that that continues. I hope that that remains that way, but I'm going to continue doing those breath holds to abolish that, uh, the over breathing that I think it was causing my asthma. Yeah. So I'll, I'll add on that one at the end, go read the auction advantage for those who haven't read it yet. Um, Kyle, it's been a great pleasure chatting with you today. Where can people follow you on social? Uh, I'm only on Instagram. It's Kyle Ruth underscore TTT training think tank. Um, you can also follow Training Think Tank's social or uh, YouTube channel, where I'm frequently on the Corpus Animus podcast. I've got some little uh, side pieces of content that I often put together with Chris, who does such a fantastic job with it. Even if you you don't follow it for the content, follow for the uh, the entertaining content that Chris puts together up there. 
Now, Chris has definitely grown into his own over the last few years and it is doing magical things. So yeah, big shout out to him as well. Um, Kyle, I really appreciate you taking the time, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care.